Alright, so today we're going to be talking about Europe through this age of absolutism. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so by the end of the Renaissance, new nations were forming in Europe and starting to create their own countries away from these rulers. And a lot of those ruler nations were ruled by these powerful kings that were known as these unlimited power monarchs, known as absolute monarchs. And this is going to be this area, era from 1600 to around the mid-1700s, and it's going to be known as the Age of Absolutism. Alright, so during the Middle Ages, European kings weren't all that powerful. Um, again, they had the feudal lords who were really pop popular in those manners that we talked about in European feudalism. And they had the loyalty of knights, so the lords started gaining more and more power. It's kind of similar to in Japan where the shogun had all the power. In Europe, as time went on, the lords began gaining more and more power over the king. Um, back at that time, of course, the Catholic Church was the dominant religion, and the Pope had power over the peasants. So the Crusades really stimulated trade, and it's going to lead to that rise of cities in Europe. So people are starting to interact with each other more, and that's going to spark the Renaissance, which weakened the power of those feudal lords. Um, and as feudalism declined in Europe, the power of kings started, kings started to increase. So you ended up having the end of the Renaissance, and all of a sudden the kings got even more powerful. And so they ended up taking over this absolute power. So, England's going to have this thing called the Hundred Years' War, and during that war, which again, uh, if you lived in England, they spent a lot of time talking about Hundred Years' War. We kind of run through it here in the U.S., you know, I don't know. Um, but during the Hundred Years' War, new weapons like cannons and longbows are going to weaken the power of the nobles and the knights, because again, they can take out entire castles very quickly. Um, also, the power of the Catholic Church, Church was weakened, and as, as a result of the Crusades and the Protestant Reformation, again, people started seeing other ideas besides the Catholic Church, which people saw was very corrupt at the time. So this rise of absolute monarchs. Okay, so during the Renaissance, the kings would tax merchants and bankers and use that wealth to build these powerful armies. And the monarchs would use this power to build these centralized governments to control their nations. And when I say centralized, I mean it's all located in one place. I know a lot of people have some issues with what a decentralized government is, where it's all spread throughout. Centralized means it's all located in one place. And in these countries, it's going to be controlled by the king. So he's got complete control. It's all located at his palace. Um, so some of these monarchs also used overseas exploration to gain colonies and to try to increase their wealth and power. And by 1600, a lot of these kings became these absolute monarchs. So you got like... Louis over in France, Frederick the Great of Prussia, Philip of Spain, and Maria Theresa of Austria. We'll talk about these a little bit more later on. Um, but this idea of absolute monarchy, make sure you know this term. It's a government with which one king holds all the power within a country. And these absolute monarchs are going to control all aspects of the nation, including taxes, their religion, the military, and the economy. Absolutism is not that hard to understand. Just think um, King John from Robin Hood, and you've got an absolute monarch. Someone who's in complete control. He always just wants taxes and money from his commoners, his people. And honestly, is just a complete ruler. Okay? So if you get Robin Hood, you've got the idea of absolutism. Okay? But we do need to know some of the different specifics. Another thing you need to know is this thing called divine right. It's this idea that the God created the monarchy and that kings answered only to God. So it's having that divine right to rule. And the best way you can remember this, if you remember when we talked about the mandate of heaven last semester... It's literally the exact same thing, but the Europeans just call it divine right. That you have that divine right to rule over your people. So one of these major absolute monarchs is this guy named Louis XIV. So before Louis came to power, France was in conflict between these two different groups. You had the Catholics and the French Protestants, no, tall, they were, and they were called the Huguenots. So these two groups are fighting with each other, um, mostly off the basis of religion. So... King Henry IV of, of France tried to fix this issue by declaring this religious toleration, saying France will allow all religions in this thing called the Edict of Nantes. But after he died, these Catholic leaders are going to end up taking control of France, so they get rid of that and say, you know, no, we don't want to be tolerant, good, why? That's, that was cute, let's take that away. And then they weaken the power of the nobles and increase the power of the monarchy. So they said, we're just going to make this a whole Catholic nation, ignore what that guy said with the, the Edict of Nantes, that doesn't exist. So, Louis XIV is going to rise to power during this time when France is this absolute monarchy. So, Louis was a Catholic, so of course they really liked him. Um, and he ruled for 72 years and became this classic example of what it means to be an absolute monarch. So, basically, he believed that he was the government. He is in complete control and nobody else can tell him what to do. 
So he excluded nobles from the different government decisions, and he'd hire bureaucrats who would collect taxes and enforce laws for him. And Louis even called himself the Sun King because he felt that French power shined down to the people from him because he was just that amazing, that brilliant, that he could be a Sun King. He was basically the sun to everyone. So with this, his wealth, he built this really powerful army and he transformed France into this powerful nation in Europe. So what he did wasn't terrible. I mean, he also had his, academic, his economic advisors who used overseas colonies and mercantilism to generate wealth. And he also meant, encouraged manufacturing to try to make France self-sufficient. Not the worst, but he also was very arrogant and believed he was the best of the best. So he also did things like involving France in these expensive wars to, that failed to gain France lands, and it led to a lot of massive debts. Because again, one of the big things about him, since he's the Sun King, he said, well, I'm the Sun, I deserve a lot of money. So he's going to have all these battles, but they don't really work out too great. But he does use a lot of taxation to get a lot of wealth. And so he's going to create this beautiful thing known as the Palace of Versailles, which I actually went to. And here's a couple pictures of just what my experience was when I visited. I went um, on a trip in high school, after 10th grade actually, and uh, we went and explored all of this area, beautiful lands. One of the things I noticed, because again, like I was 16 and I didn't really care about a lot of this stuff, to be quite honest, all I was like, oh, pretty buildings. Um, and one of the prettiest things was the gardens. The gardens were just beautiful. Everyone was out there taking pictures of it. Like, it was just gorgeous. Um, so here's some pictures of the gardens too. It's just a really nice, beautiful palace. But again, the significance of it is You've got this king and he's showing off all of his wealth and saying, look how much money I have. I'm better than everyone else. But actually the rest of France is going to be in poverty, which we're going to talk about later because it's going to lead to people getting angry and the French Revolution. But we'll get to all that later. So as a result of Louis, France became one of the most powerful nations in Europe. But after decades of lavish spending, it's going to lead to a lot of debts and heavy taxes that France just can't pay off. And the people are going to grow really frustrated and eventually overthrow the monarchy. And again, we'll get into all of that coming up in a later video. Okay. But the next monarch we'll talk about is this guy named Peter the Great of Russia. Okay, so Russia was really influenced by the Byzantine Empire. Again, it was part of the Byzantine Empire for a while until it was conquered by the Mongols. And so one of their leaders, Ivan III, is going to successfully liberate Russia from the Mongols. And he's going to be rule ruling as the first Tsar. And Tsar is basically like um, over when we talked about in Rome where they had the Caesars where that's just the title for a king, okay? In Russia, they're called czars. So over time, czars are going to expand Russia's borders, they're going to increase the power of the nobles, and they're going to create that absolute monarchy in Russia. So by the time Peter the Great became czar, Russia was this huge empire, but it wasn't quite as advanced as the nations we've already talked about. Okay, so Russia was isolated from Western Europe, and it didn't really know that much about the ideas of the Renaissance. So while European nations grew wealthy from trade, they made cultural advancements, and they had really strong economies, Russia just wasn't quite as advanced. It didn't have an advanced industry, there were no overseas colonies, and it was an economy of mostly made up of small-scale farmers. There weren't very many, like, up-and-coming people. And a lot of the Russians were these feudal peasants working for nobles, known as boyars, okay? So the nobles in Russia are called a boyar, okay? So Peter the Great, this guy right here, wanted to modernize and westernize Russia just to try to catch up with Europe. So what he did was he went to Europe and he disguised himself and pretended just to be some peasant so he could take notes and figure out how Western Europe worked. So while he was in Europe, he learned these new ideas about shipbuilding, about how to manufacture goods, how to organize your government, how to, how to do some city planning, what their culture was like, like the music and the fashion. So he took all that stuff back and he returned from Europe and then he posed these different reforms in his attempts to westernize Russia. So like he adopted European fashion, so he banned beards for men so they can't wear a beard anymore because it doesn't look like that European look. Um, so veils, also women couldn't wear a veil. He adopted things like European calendars, he improved farming techniques, he used mercantilism, he created iron and lumber factories, modernized the army and navy, uh, and then also, more significantly, he made himself the head of the Orthodox Church. So like. Henry VIII, Henry, 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 you all remember from the song you guys still are talking about in class. Um, that guy, if you'll remember, made himself the head of the Church of England when they started the Anglican Church. So Peter's going to do the same thing, but make himself the head of the Orthodox Church, just to give him even more absolute power. So Peter also expanded Russia's borders, and he even built this new city that he styled based off of European architecture, and he called that St. Petersburg, and that would become the capital of Russia. 
Okay. So some of the legacies of Peter the Great, he became, uh, he helped Russia to become a more advanced Western nation. Um, but at the same time, modernization was really slow and it helped where Russia, like they worked, it, it was helpful, but they didn't really industrialize until World War I. And during World War I, they had these different revolutionaries that overthrew the monarch and it created this radical new government that was based mostly on socialism and communism, which is a big thing we're going to get to later on. So then in England, you had the absolute ruler, Elizabeth I. So England before Elizabeth I, um, unlike other nations in Europe, England had a pretty limited monarchy rather than an absolute monarchy. So the monarch didn't necessarily say everything they said had to happen. You know, they had a little bit of other things. Like, the nobles usually had a little bit more input. Um, and, like, even during the Middle Ages, for example, the English nobles revolted against the cruel king who overtaxed them and said, we don't like being taxed like this. We're going to rise up and fight. So during that time, they forced the king, King John, which you'll never guess where King John comes from. That's the guy from um, Robin Hood right there. So when, when that happened, they basically overthrew him and said, we don't like how we're being taxed. And they forced him to sign this thing known as the Magna Carta. It's this document that basically limits the government's power and it protects citizens' rights. Gives more power to the citizens. Yeah. So the Magna Carta is going to create this thing known as a limited monarchy. And it's going to lead to the formation of Parliament in 1295. Which, Parliament, it's just like Congress. It's a legislative group of people uh, who work with the king to pass laws and taxes. And it's led by the Prime Minister. Um, again, pretty simple. So... Elizabeth's father was King Henry VIII, and he's transformed England during that Protestant Reformation by creating the, Angl the Anglican Church. And after his death, his son Hed Edward became king, but died at only the age of 15. So they had to find someone else to lead the throne. So they had this person named Mary, who was Elizabeth's sister, and she tried to convert England back to Catholicism and make it, pro and make it Catholic. So the Protestants, who ignored Bloody Mary, as she was later called, were executed. Um, and that's going to be a whole thing right here. So after Mary, Bloody Mary died in 1558, Elizabeth I eventually became queen. And she's going to rule for 45 years and become the greatest monarch in English history. Uh, one thing that people know about her is she's known as the Virgin Queen because she refused to share power with a man and never married. She made that her vow, like she wanted to rule as her own thing, which I think is awesome. So during Elizabeth's reign, she worked with Parliament to set a lot of different issues. And one of the main ones would be is would England be Anglican or would it go back to Catholicism before Henry 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 happened? So Elizabeth and Parliament passed this Act of Uniformity, which made Anglicanism the official religion of England. But a lot of Catholic rituals and traditions would still stay on, and that's going to create some issues within um, Britain. Okay. So one thing that Elizabeth does is promote capitalism and mercantilism by encouraging these joint stock companies to invest in overseas exploration and colonization. And during her reign as queen, England experienced this golden age in culture, particularly in literature and theater. So this is when you're going to get to the huge rise of theater. Um, so I actually went and saw Shakespeare's Globe. These are some pictures of Shakespeare. I actually saw his Globe. We got to go see a play um, performed there when I visited England a couple years ago. And it was really, it was so fascinating to be able to see a play there. Um, it, was, it was just so cool. Uh, one of the best things I've ever done. So after Elizabeth's death in 1603, the Stuart family is going to assume the monarch. And unlike Elizabeth, these kings refused to work with Parliament, and they really tried to create this absolute monarchy in England. And that absolute monarchy is going to get challenged in this thing known as the Glorious Revolution, or the English Revolution, um, which we'll talk about in a later video. Okay, but that's all I have for you guys, um, and I'll see you guys next time we talk about the Enlightenment. Bye!